Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm very gratified to be here. Uh, it's an honor to help get out the truth about, about health care. Uh, Steve mentioned a number of diseases, such as diabetes. Uh, only two uh, causes of death exceed medical error in the United States, uh, heart disease and cancer. Heart disease is a little bit more than half a million deaths per year. Cancer is a little bit less. Medical error uh, is conservatively estimated at killing 250,000 people per year. There are different estimates. Uh, uh, probably uh, the best study uh, was done by uh, NASA's chief toxicologist. It was a study of studies, and it ranged medical error at between uh, 210 and 440,000 deaths per year. So I am not a medical malpractice attorney. Uh, you might say, well, you are an attorney. How did you get into this? And I'll, t I'll tell you in a minute. Um, I don't even think that the medical malpractice system, uh, although I think it's beneficial in, in terms of compensating a few seriously injured people, I don't think it helps with the medical error problem in America. Uh, and I'll talk about that as well. So how did I get, get involved in, in this topic? Well, I've, uh, over the years, in addition to my legal career, I've written about a host of industries, mainly large industries, um, uh, steel, agribusiness, corrections, uh, law enforcement, uh, finance, uh, and so forth. Well, there's, there's no industry really bigger in the United States today than healthcare. It's about 22% of the economy about $2.7 trillion. And I got into it, I got interested in thinking about this uh, in about 15 years ago uh, when my professional mentor, a very distinguished uh, uh, African-American civil rights attorney, uh, a contemporary really of, of Thurgood Marshall named Bird Brown went into the hospital at the age of 70 to have a lung transplant. He was a very sick man, uh, very ill. You don't get a transplant like that unless, unless you are quite ill. And he survived the transplant. But afterwards, uh, he was given uh, uh, 10 times the dosage that he should have gotten of an anti-rejection drug, and uh, he died. That's called a medication error. And then I started, I started to keep a file, as I do, about certain matters that interest me, particularly about business and industry and government. Uh, and I started to see things happen uh, among my own friends and family, uh, many of whom, including my father, came home from the hospital uh, with serious hospital-acquired infections which we call HAIs, uh, in the, or at least that's what the prof medical profession calls them. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, he was, uh, it, it, it very much affected uh, uh, his, his last years before he died. If you get a bloodborne infection, you're a very sick individual. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, have experienced that or seen it among your friends and family. Uh, my mother, in her later years, uh, uh, had uh, uh, brain surgery for a fast-growing non-malignant tumor. Uh, she survived it. Unfortunately, the team that uh, there was no proper exchange of information between the uh, uh, neurosurgeon and the medical team following her. So she didn't receive an anti-seizure medication. Uh, she went into uh, a coma. This is after she, she had apparently recovered relatively well from the surgery, and uh, uh, she was left paralyzed. She was a hemiplegic uh, for her remaining years. Uh, in 2011, I had relatively mysterious condition myself. Uh, Suddenly on one of my feet, it, it became very uh, 
uh, uh, dark on the toes, were darkened considerably, looked like gangrene, felt horrible, I couldn't walk. Uh, normally I'm a very mobile kind of a person. So one day I went into the emergency room thinking that perhaps I had a clot. No one could diagnose this. Uh, the emergency department physician uh, uh, referred me to a, uh, made a referral to a, a vascular surgeon attending physician who was going to come in and assess cutting my toes off. Well, I made the uh, decision to call a, a very good friend, my best, my best friend really, uh, who is uh, my PCP, my family physician. And he came to the hospital and he said, well, we don't know what's wrong with you, but get out of here. And I did. I left the hospital. Eventually, I got diagnosed with uh, uh, a platelet disorder. I have high platelets, sludgy blood, clogged up the capillaries in my toes, made walking very difficult. There's a medication for that, and I take it on a maintenance basis, and I have a normal life. Uh, if he had, if they had cut off my toes, that would have been uh, uh, an unnecessary medical error, like a wrong site surgery, which the profession calls a never event. It never should happen. Unfortunately, it does happen sometimes. Interestingly enough, the, uh, my doctor friend uh, uh, sent his, well, he didn't send her, but his, his elderly mother went into a very fine university teaching complex a hospital system to have relatively routine cataract surgery. But she's an elderly person, and uh, that's a dangerous situation. Uh, you're twice as likely over the age of 65 to experience a medical error as are people uh, uh, younger. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, she had a, an anesthesia error. Uh, uh, she aspirated vomit, uh, and she died. Uh, hospitals are, as some of you know, dangerous places. So are long-term care facilities. So are clinics. Uh, we're finding today that, and I'm going to talk about this towards the end of the talk, uh, really the most common medical error the one that we can't get our arms around is diagnostic error. You can have late diagnosis. You can have non-diagnosis. You can have over-diagnosis. Uh, but in any event, that seems to be the uh, greatest killer. Uh, uh, the studies are somewhat preliminary, uh, but uh, I, was, I went to Johns Hopkins, great medical system, great hospital with a great history, and the leader of the largest study, which was printed in the British Medical Journal, uh, a man named David Newman Toker, uh, re reflected on diagnostic error, and based on, on certain studies, and I'm going to get again to this at the end of of, of, the, of the talk uh, says that just in the diagnostic, just from diagnostic errors, these are mainly made, two thirds of them are made in doctor's offices. There are 100,000 to 500,000 annually. We don't know how many exactly. We know they're the most common. We know from a 25 year study of something called the National Practitioners Database that appeared in the British Medical Journal, sometimes called the BMJ, that uh, the National Practitioners Database includes all malpractice verdicts and settlements. You can't get into it, uh, basically, unless you're a researcher or you have a, a, a case or you're defending a case of malpractice. But in terms of uh, it, it was uh, uh, the largest source of medical errors by far, and also paid out 
uh, uh, this is a 25-year longitudinal study, paid out the greatest amount, I believe something like $38 billion. It's been confirmed by local and regional post-mortem or autopsy studies, which show that generally, but depending on the study, between 20 to 40 percent of us uh, die with a diagnostic error. So that's something that, that really we're, we're way behind on uh, and uh, uh, requires more study, but not just more study of hospitals, which are the usual places we study in terms of medical errors, in terms of, uh, but, in term, but we must study now uh, the doctors who deal with us and the clinics where we go. Okay, how did America become involved in, in medical error? Well, during most of the 20th century, at least, we, we venerated doctors and hospitals. I see some uh, people here who look like they're seniors, and they will remember how doctors were portrayed, doctors and hospitals and uh, were portrayed on the Marcus Welby show or by Norman Rockwell. All doctors were considered to be uh, uh, wise, competent, uh, not in a hurry, uh, and thoughtful. And they would get to the root of the problem, we thought. Hospitals were considered to be charitable institutions. That's why we didn't tax them uh, starting bet uh, before World War II. Uh, uh, they were thought to be charitable, ins charitable institutions, clean, quiet, competent, safe places. Well, that started to change. And it started to change in the late 20th century. Some of the changes came from very well publicized celebrity cases. Some very prominent people suddenly died, uh, uh, generating a lot of news. One was John Wayne. He went for a routine colonoscopy at Harvard, of all places, and they missed cancerous polyps and he died. Andy Warhol, the most prominent uh, artist in America um, went into the best hospital in New York City, New York Hospital, for routine gallbladder surgery. He's a healthy 58-year-old man, and he died due to poor, it appears to be poor aftercare of uh, over-irrigation with the fluids that were in him, that were uh, uh, piped into him. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, was the victim of an attempted assassination, but because his medical care was not handled properly, uh, there was an, an accident requiring serious emergency lung surgery, and he almost died uh, from malpractice. Uh, some of the older uh, members of the audience may remember a uh, a famous uh, journalist of his time, a columnist in New York City named Sidney Zion, a real uh, uh, crusading uh, 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 pundit uh, columnist. And uh, his 18-year-old daughter, Libby Zion, in 1984, uh, went to the hospital in New York, basically healthy, uh, uh, 18-year-old, uh, she had a 102-degree fever. Uh, she um, had some uh, uh, jerking-type movements. Well, she went in there. There were no full-fledged attending physicians in the hospital, just overworked, underslept residents. So they managed her rather than treated her. They restrained her. Uh, and they uh, uh, created a uh, uh, medication error uh, with uh, uh, an antispasmodic and a, uh, the mixture of an antispasmodic and a, uh, um, an opi opioid. 
and she was dead in the morning. Now, Sidney Zion was, would not sit still for this, and uh, uh, he filed every type of lawsuit you could, including uh, for a trial on court TV. Some of you may remember court TV. Uh, famous trials were on court TV for a while, and then, then they weren't for the most part. But anyhow, this trial was, and uh, New York State started to look at the conditions of residents and found that they were working basically endlessly. They were great profit centers for hospitals because you could pay them uh, low wages and you could, you could work them around the clock. And as a result of uh, the crusade uh, by Sydney Zion, there's something called the Libby Zion Law in New York, which means no resident can work more than 24 hours straight. It seems like too much, but that's a reform. No resident can work more than 80 hours in a week. That sounds like a lot, but that's a reform. And perhaps more important, residents are treated or should be treated like airline pilots. If they feel sick for any reason, they have the right, the human right, if you will, to call off. They don't have to uh, participate. They don't have to do their shifts. They don't have to participate in surgeries. They can just take off. So that was, that was a major reform. There was another case that I'll talk about, the case of, uh, that was very, very prominent. Uh, in 1994, this focused the, the country's attention on medical error. The medical writer of the Boston Globe uh, was a young mother named Betsy Lehman, a very fine medical writer. Uh, and uh, she had cancer, and she went into a very highly regarded hospital called the Dana-Farber Cancer Center uh, in Boston, uh, where she had her bone marrow transplant. And then afterwards, she was given uh, probably, I'd say about 16 times the dose of uh, cytoxin, uh, a chemotherapeutic agent that she should have been given. Uh, she uh, survived the transplant, uh, started to vomit up pieces of her own guts, and died. Well that this could happen, that this type of a medication error could be approved and ratified by distinguished doctors and oncology nurses caused a furor. And uh, many were fired at Dana-Farber, at Dana and Dana-Farber implemented what became a leader in automated uh, dosage warning controls. They hadn't had them before. Now you should have them when you go into a hospital and if they're going to order an overdose, the machine will print out uh, a warning. At that time it would, was a skull, skull and, cross, and crossbones. I don't know what most of the modern ones are uh, today. Uh, at Duke University Hospital, Duke Medical Center in, in 20, 2003, and again, these were national cases. Some of you may, may have heard of them, but they riveted our attention on these errors. It was a uh, young, illegal, if you will, undocumented immigrant girl from Mexico. Her family crossed illegally so that she could get uh, medical care for her heart condition, which, um, uh, her heart, her heart would never function well. It wouldn't pump properly ever. So uh, she became a candidate for a heart-lung block to be transplanted in her. It was a very serious operation, obviously. A lot of controversy because these so-called blocks are quite rare. And uh, the nation we had a national debate about whether an illegal 
immigrant should get this type of uh, uh, organ system uh, over a real citizen. And it became, it, it focused the media uh, and the talking heads and the ethicists and so forth. Well, she got the transplant and it was successful, but it didn't match her blood type. No one had checked. Uh, uh, they found the organs in the uh, uh, National Organ Harvesting Donation System. It was the right size for a 12-year-old girl. It wasn't the right blood type. So her antibodies attacked this block, and it had to be removed. And then the surgeon said, let's get her another one. And they found another one with the right blood type. And the, of course, the debate went on and on. And uh, uh, she, uh, her system was pretty much shot. And she unfortunately died. But now we have uh, more checking systems. After the, after the Santillon uh, disaster, uh, the head of uh, the Federal Agency uh, for Healthcare Research and Quality called AHRQ, which is a good agency, but very underfunded and not particularly powerful. It looks into things like medical error. Her name was Carolyn Clancy. She said at the time, it occurs to me that there's more double checking and systematic avoidance of mistakes at Starbucks than at most healthcare institutions. True at the time. So, but there has been some change in the culture such that now we um, uh, do a, a, a vast amount of double checking. Uh, uh, and everybody knows the roles that they must play, particularly in a surgical uh, arena. Uh, and everybody checks on everybody else, and that's a good thing. At Johns Hopkins, and some of you may have heard of another little girl named Josie King. Josie King uh, also, as with some of these other people, changed the world. Josie King, uh, uh, her family was wealthy. Um, uh, that's no... Uh, uh, bar against medical error. They had just moved into a new home in the Baltimore area. Uh, it was a beautiful renovated farmhouse in the, in the suburbs. Uh, her grandmother came, uh, uh, took a bubble bath. Little Josie went in the bathroom at the time, saw the bubbles, was entranced by them. Grandma got out, went down to help fix dinner. Uh, there were screams from the bathroom upstairs. Josie, who was precocious, turned on the hot water and got in. Um, she was rushed with second and third degree burns over most of her body uh, to Johns Hopkins, uh, a, a miraculous medical center, probably the most famous in terms of children's care in the United States. Uh, she had uh, skin grafts and uh, uh, successfully uh, survived her burns and was set to go home. Unfortunately, she, her, her antibiotics were not properly managed, so she got an infection from that. Uh, she had a problem with uh, um, pain control with, with opioids, uh, and uh, she was not being hydrated properly. Um, uh, Johns Hopkins, as good as it was, was doing a very crude measure of uh, uh, hydration, which is called, and, and, and uh, evacuation, called ins and outs. They were weighing her waist versus her intake, very crude. There are better tests. 
you've all had them, uh, 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 and uh, that that uh, show dehydration. Uh, at some point, she was uh, sucking on her washcloth. She wasn't getting enough from water, the little water and ice chips they were giving her. Uh, a nurse tried to get a doctor to come see her. Chain of command was such that the doctor didn't come. Uh, I guess, I don't know why, sometimes doctors don't come. Sometimes you can't get them. So the, the, she died and Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, uh, to its credit, uh, had a brilliant uh, uh, critical care anesthesiologist uh, with a public health orientation named Peter Pronovost. You may have heard of him. He's the most prominent anti-error doctor in the United States because of this case. Investigate. He didn't pull any punches and he wrote, uh, uh, Josie died of a third world disease, dehydration in the best hospital in the world, his hospital. Uh, and he and Josie King's mother started to uh, lecture on patient safety. Uh, now there were, it wasn't just dehydration that, that killed Josie King, she also had uh, two infections, one from poor antibiotic management. The other was from something called a central line associated bloodstream infection. Central lines, as many of you know, deliver vital medicines and nutrients into patients, but Hopkins made a mistake. It up her central line in her groin area in what is known as the femoral site. The femoral site is a, a place of great infection. Uh, so, so Josie died of a combination of those things. Uh, Peter Pronovost went on to be the great reformer in this country in a technical area where infections were uh, basically expected. It was just expected in hospitals that a certain percentage of people who have central lines will become infected by them. This is one of the problems with, with healthcare. There's, there's complacency. Some things are just expected to happen. Infections, patient, elderly patients having delirium, some of them falling, uh, a certain amount of, of, of mistakes, surgical site infections, wrong side surgeries, things of that nature. It's, it's been a given for a long time. Peter Pronovo said no. He actually studied uh, 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 central uh, line associated bloodstream infections uh, uh, at Hopkins and around the country and found that there was, at Hopkins, by the way, the great hospital, 11% uh, of central line patients were, were getting infected. In the United States, it was about 4% uh, uh, at the time. So the great hospital, and this is often true of teaching hospitals, just assumed it was better. It was not. So what Peter Pronovos did was he developed a bundle for eliminating central line infections. Sometimes these are called best practices. Sometimes they're called protocols. But usually they're called bundles. And if you go into a hospital or a nursing home or a clinic where a procedure is being done, you want to ask, what is the bundle? What is the, what is the punch list? If they don't have one, you might not want to be in that environment. 
you might want to go somewhere where there is. Now, Pronovost bundle was, was very simple. It was a five-part bundle. Wash your hands using soap or alcohol prior to placing the catheter. That's the insertion uh, tube. Wear sterile gloves, hat, mask, and gown, and completely cover the patient with sterile drapes. Avoid placing the catheter in the groin if possible, as these have a higher infection rate. Clean the insertion site on the patient's skin with chlorhexidine antiseptic solution. For whatever reason, this relatively gentle uh, 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 disinfectant uh, seems to be statistically the best at, at, at blocking infections. And finally, remove catheters. Central lines are, are catheters. They're, they're tubes that go into the body when they are no longer needed. Because we know that when catheters, whether they're urinary catheters or whether they're central lines or whether they're other types of lines, the longer they stay in, the more prone we are to infections. So we, Peter Pronovost learned a lot. And when he applied this, to Hopkins, and these are some of the sickest patients who have central lines, infection went to nearly zero. Then he applied it to the entire state of Michigan. Infection went to zero. He applied it to Rhode Island. Infection went to zero. He applied it in Spain. Infection went to zero. He is a great man. He is truly a great man. And he did something similar with people on ventilators or respirators. Very, very sick people. But with protocols, the infection rates, and what kills people on ventilators, by the way, well, they have, they're very sick, but what, what, what kills them is, uh, uh, is infection, usually pneumonia. It can be a fungal infection often, but you want to get them off the ventilator if you possibly can. You don't want to just leave, it, leave them on it. You don't want to make them dependent. And what Peter Pronovost and his team found, uh, you're kind, was that, uh, People on ventilators don't need to become infected. And if it's not their time, they don't need to die. So he is, he is truly a great person. And what you want when you or your loved one or your friend is in the hospital on a respirator or on a central line, you want to say, what's the bundle? What's the protocol? What's the five-part thing, system, that everybody has to uh, 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 abide by and everybody should know? And if you do that, that's what you're looking for. Doctors, by the way, as we have found again and again, are not universal geniuses. They don't know everything. They can't remember everything about surgery, about uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, about procedures. They have to be part of systems. They have to be part of teams. Now, another very famous case from the uh, uh, late, well, actually it was 1979, involved the Shah of Iran. Many people here are old enough to remember the Shah of Iran. Uh, uh, he uh, actually left Iran uh, for medical care. He had uh, a number of medical problems, including lymphatic cancer. He had enlarged uh, spleen. He had tumors in his neck. Uh, uh, and I don't even think that was the end of it. So what does one of the richest and most powerful men in the world do? He gets the best 
the, the world's most famous surgeon to deal with him, a man named Dr. Michael DeBakey. Dr. Michael DeBakey was a tremendous cardiothoracic innovator. He seeded the first artificial heart and many uh, 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 heart prosthetics and valves and so forth, many types of procedures. If you go into a surgical theater, someone may ask for a debakey. A debakey is a type of forceps that uh, he invented. Uh, he won the, the Lasker Award, which is uh, the greatest award that a practicing clinician can win. Nobel Prizes typically go to um, uh, uh, researchers, but when you're talking clinicians, physicians, the, the Lasker Award is for a body of great practical application. Well, the, the Shaw needed spleen surgery. And as you may remember, those of you who remember that crisis where there was a revolution in Iran and uh, uh, the radicals under the Ayatollah Khomeini took over, and there was um, uh, um, a, uh, uh, an invasion of the United States Embassy in Iran, in Tehran. Well, there were actually two invasions. One was just they went, uh, they went through it and sacked it, these uh, student radicals, young people, and they didn't take any hostages. It was just to show America that uh, we were backing, in their view, the wrong uh, uh, leader. However, the Shah came to the United States, and when that happened, he came to the United States for surgery. When that happened, and uh, that's when the hostages. That's when the, the second invasion of the U.S. Embassy was. It's the reason why it occurred. Uh, the Shah was admitted to the United States for medical care, and they took the hostages. That's the reason. So what did Jimmy Carter do? Uh, among other things, what he did was he kicked the Shah out. The Shah had had uh, uh, some procedures in New York City but not the main one that he needed. And the Shah started traveling around again, and finally he went to Egypt and had, uh, uh, had his surgery there by Dr. Michael DeBakey, caused riots in Egypt for the Shah to be there. Uh, and, uh, but Michael DeBakey was a heart surgeon. He wasn't a general surgeon who did complex gut surgeries. And in doing the surgery, he nicked the Shaw's pancreas. That's right, you don't want to do that. And the Shaw uh, became inf infected. Uh, uh, he uh, 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 blew up with, uh, he swelled, he had edema with uh, uh, pus and pancreatic pieces. I don't have to go into that and after a couple of weeks he died of those complications. Now, one of the other things that we have learned, and this is critical, is experience matters. Nothing matters more when you go into treatment than the actual experience of the people who are going to be treating you. Michael DeBakey was the greatest heart surgeon in history to this date, but he was not a great general surgeon. He hadn't done any of that since his residency, really. He was the wrong choice. And study after study shows that the, the experienced physicians give you the best outcome. So what do you want to do when you go to the doctor? Gonna, most people are going to go to the doctor. I know that there are many 
holistic and, and, and dietary ways of treating various conditions. But eventually, most people in America are going to go to the doctor. Indeed, the average American has nine surgeries over the course of a lifetime. That's, that's a, a, the most serious medical intervention. You want to know exactly how many of these procedures the doctor has done. He or she must tell you the answer. If he or she doesn't and has a bad outcome, that's more grounds for a lawsuit, not perhaps on uh, uh, medical malpractice, but in terms of informed consent. Okay, you want to know how many procedures he's done, you want to know his infection rate, and you want to know his outcomes. Now, there was a, there's a very famous case the ca in Colorado, uh, the case of Michael Skolnick. Michael Skolnick was a big young man, large, I think he was about 6'5 or 6'6, six, six, a strapping guy, and he was um, uh, taking an antidepressant called Welbutrin for smoking control. I don't know who prescribed it, but I guess they do that occasionally. Well, he had a, a bad result on that. He had a seizure. So he had a seizure and he went to a neurosurgeon in Colorado. The neurosurgeon prescribed a CT scan. The CT scan that appeared to show a speck on the top of the brain. The surgeon said, the neurosurgeon said, oh, I can get that out. That's not even uh, 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 digging into the brain. It's just on the surface. I've done it before successfully. Okay. Well, there's a real question today about whether there actually was a speck on Michael Skolnick's brain. Uh, maybe there was an artifact on the CT. We don't, we don't really know. But the surgeon did the um, procedure, and uh, Michael Skolnick uh, uh, lost a great deal of his intellectual capacity, a great deal of his vision. Uh, uh, he became like a, a kid in the primary grades. He gained 100 pounds, was profoundly depressed, and ultimately died. But again, he had a great-hearted mother named Patty Skolnick, and she organized people in Colorado to pass the Michael Skolnick Medical Transparency Act. Now, one of the things about this surgeon was that he had lost his license in a couple of states. He, he's one of these medical vagabonds, gets in trouble in Kansas, moves to Colorado. And there have been a number of these cases. Well, the, the Michael Skolnick Medical Transparency Act, which has been copied in about 20 states, uh, showed that, uh, uh, will we'll show you how many malpractice cases a doctor has had, if there are any verdicts against him or her, uh, if there's been any trouble with his license in any state and or with regard to prescribing with the DEA, Drug Enforcement uh, Agency. So that's a good thing. Unfortunately, it doesn't specifically address experience, and no law uh, uh, does. It's, it's a flaw in the law, if you will. So you really have to ask yourself. Anecdotally, experientially, I think most doctors will tell you the truth and allow you to uh, be a prudent medical consumer. Again, the reason is if something goes wrong, then perhaps your uh, uh, consent was not informed. Um, these cases, the famous and the average 
really changed our attitudes uh, about, about uh, uh, and our ex own experiences uh, changed our attitudes about medical care. In 1997, the National Patient Safety Foundation of the AMA had a poll where 42% of people said that either they or a friend or a relative had been the victim of a medical error. Um, I don't think my personal experience was so exceptional. Uh, a medical error was defined as a preventable adverse event leading to uh, death or serious, indis, uh, in serious bodily injury. In 2006, only 13% of Americans in a Harris interactive poll agreed with the statement, on the whole, the healthcare system works pretty well. 2006, only 13% of us uh, uh, um, believed that the hospital, that the um, health care system works pretty well. We were obviously becoming dissatisfied. 82% uh, of us wanted all hospital medical errors to be available to the public. Well, they're not, but that's what we want. Uh, and in the internet era, two-thirds of us now uh, do research on the diagnoses that we receive from our providers, which is in large measure a good thing. Now, sometimes medical research is obviously complicated, and sometimes people, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, get a, uh, uh, maybe a, a partial result from their research that is not helpful. So really, you have to uh, it's fine to do research. I would also do it in conjunction with somebody uh, who maybe you have a friend who's a uh, doctor, nurse, uh, maybe retired. Uh, do it in conjunction with somebody who, who understands medicine. I can't say that I do. I've done all of this research, and I was fortunate uh, to have... Uh, uh, and I acknowledge them in my book, a gamut of, of doctors and nurses who I could call up and say, hey, what does this mean? Is this significant? Am I uh, going down the wrong path here? And sometimes I was. Okay. Um, in 1999, the a unit of the National Academy of Sciences called the Institute of Medicine. Probably the most prestigious private organization in medicine in the United States, the IOM, uh, came out with a report called To Air ERR is Human. This is the most uh, uh, important medical document, and there have been many, but this is the most important medical document of the 20th century. Uh, and in that document, uh, the Institute of Medicine looked at, uh, 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 closely at studies, intensive chart reviews in New York, Colorado, and Utah, and said, that um, there were 44,000 to 98,000 medical deaths in the, in the United States annually. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. That, was, that would have been the eighth largest cause of death at the time. Uh, the, there was publicity that went out in the media that said that was the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every day for a year. It's an astonishing amount of human carnage. And it did uh, uh, 
create a lot of media for a time. It turns out, it turns out that it's low. And computers have told us that. Now there have been analyses, uh, analyses of charts using something called global trigger tools. Global trigger tools are electronic algorithms that appear in electronic health records that show errors. Uh, and some of the errors are not uh, necessarily uh, uh, obvious. For example, Josie King, she had a medical error. She was over opiated in a hospital and she had to receive a drug that we all know about from the heroin epidemic called Narcan or Naloxone, which is an antidote to uh, uh, opiation. That is, a that is evidence of a medical error. So the new studies uh, uh, use these global trigger tools then they extrapolate them. They're usually in, you can't do it for the whole United States. So they do it in various regions and then extrapolate to the approximate 35 million hospital admissions we have per year. And they come up with this number of, of deaths, which is shocking, which is which is third to um, uh, heart disease and cancer. And the profession accepts that. Anybody knowledgeable, well, just about everybody knowledgeable in the profession says, yes, we have a problem, and what are we going to do about it? Now, as I said before, um, uh, we don't know it, it could be even greater than that because the estimates to date have not include diagnostic error. Diagnostic error, when analyzed, appears to be independently the greatest source of fatalities. Now, the leader of the largest study of diagnostic errors, the principal author, uh, of the British Medical Journal study of the longitudinal study of, of the National Practitioners Database, 25, year, uh, 25 years of data, says that we know that there are now at least 100,000 and as many as 500,000 diagnostic error deaths in the United States. They're hard to get our arms around because they happen in doctor's offices mostly. Hospitals are not highly regulated environments. You might think that they are, but they are, they are not. They are, uh, uh, as I said last night in the panel, it's not a regulatory environment, it's an accreditory environment. And that means that an accrediting agency usually an august body called the Joint Commission, comes around every three years and uh, uh, looks at the hospital and some of the charts. Not good enough. Um, so, but it's even less regulated in your doctor's office. Um, and that's, that's a matter of concern. What are our big other errors besides diagnostic error? And before I leave diagnostic error, I want to say that the Institute of Medicine, that very prestigious body, that unit of the National Academy of Sciences, into error is human, did not analyze diagnostic errors. And that was, that's considered a flaw. Why, why did they do that? I can't tell you. I've talked to uh, David Newman Toker about it. He's a remarkable medical researcher. He's a neurologist also. 
Uh, his body of work is outstanding. He's uh, one of the, probably right now, uh, uh, he's on a par with Peter Pronovost as a leader in the drive against medical errors. And he's at Hopkins and has impeccable uh, uh, credentials and does uh, 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 very, very uh, outstanding research. Why? Well, the soldiers of medicine, the, the salt of the earth types, the most numerous are the people in those doctor's offices. And there's some thought, and I talked to him about it, maybe they didn't want to offend those people. Maybe they didn't want to say, hey, you're just not getting it right, and people are dying as a result. And indeed, there is some pushback from them. When, when, and I know this because recently I wrote an op-ed piece for the uh, Wall Street Journal, and I wrote about this to some extent. And the pushback from the doctors, not all of them, but the majority of them, was, was very uh, angry. Why, are you, why Wall Street Journal are you letting a trial lawyer write about this? He must be a malpractice attorney. Let doctors be doctors and we'll be fine. Don't regulate us. Things like that. Very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, disturbing to me. But uh, perhaps that's, that goes with the territory. I mean, I'm not upset about it, but uh, you could see that there's some, some resistance. Okay. What are some, now, in terms of, I'm going to talk for a minute about diagnostic error. We know what are the problems. Doctors diagnose alone. They don't diagnose in teams. It's not like being in a surgical theater where uh, uh, the nurse provides the instruments, anesthesia uh, uh, provides uh, obviously the, the sedation and the, blood, and the blood products. Uh, everybody has a role. And everybody can now, nowadays stop a surgery if necessary, if they see uh, the doctor about to, to saw the wrong leg off or something. They can do that. That's all good. There, there are no controls when the doctor diagnoses. And doctors, one problem that we know has to be done, sort of a re-education function, is called debiasing. Doctors, good doctors, have biases. They have very serious biases. Some of them are some of the some of them are risk takers. They want you to go in and have the most radical procedure because they think you'll, you know, high risk, high reward. And it's the way they do things. There are other biases that are quite serious. One is that women aren't having heart attacks. They'll send a, they'll send a man to the hospital to get uh, uh, angioplasty uh, in a second. Uh, the woman's not having a heart attack. She's not having a sharp chest pain or whatever. It's a very serious bias. So we have to, we have to engage in debiasing. We also have to bring the teamwork of the uh, of surgery into the doctor's office. Well, you say, well, my doctor's there by himself. He, he, even in an urgent, uh, you know, like in an urgent care place, he's just doing his, he or she is just doing their shift. Who are they going to talk to? What are they going to do? Well, the answer is um, the three worst letters in American medicine are FFS, fee for service. The next uh, three, which are related, are CPT, current procedural terminologies. They're related. Doctors often don't know what they're seeing, what they're doing. They know they may need other tests or procedures, but the billing codes don't allow them to pay for early conversations with 
people who know the answer or know what tests to apply, like pathologists, like radiologists who know about these burgeoning imaging technologies, who know about these probes at the molecular and genetic uh, level. Doctors, your, your clinician doesn't really know. He's in the dark about it. He or she will, will you know, just pre and prescribe or not prescribe on a whim. That's really bad. You have to watch that. So what we're trying to do, the, the patient reform groups particularly, is change the fee-for-service system so there are CPTs so that the doctor can brainstorm initially with the specialists and everybody can get paid. And Medicare is looking at, the, looking at this right now. It will probably change. It's vitally important. It's vitally important. Okay, so those are two things. Get, get di make, make it so doctors don't have to diagnose alone. That's really critical. Do it as a team, de-bias them, and it is thought, though we don't know for sure, that diagnostic error, which is a profound problem, will go down. What are other errors, major errors? I can't believe it, I've already talked almost an hour. But Okay, and also, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, if you do. Okay, medication errors. Medication errors are a big problem. We have over 10,000 prescription drugs and over 300,000 over-the-counter uh, drugs, supplements, and herbs, uh, and uh, about 5 to 10 percent of hospital patients have uh, uh, medication errors. Uh, this appears to be higher in uh, a doctor's offices. Again, there's no teamwork. Um, it, medication errors in one study cost the United States $21 billion uh, per year. Uh, as you know, uh, handwritten records by doctors are a big problem maybe less of a problem than they used to be because states have started to pass laws that say medical records must be legible. Now, there's no penalty for not having a legible uh, 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 prescription, but if there's an accident afterwards and there wasn't a legible prescription, that, that could be evidence. They, uh, we are prescription forms, and there still are handwritten prescription forms, are ridiculous. We know from uh, uh, bank checks, people should write it out twice, once with Arabic numerals, once in words, okay? When banks started to do that, errors went to zero. Is money more valuable than our health? I don't know. Okay, yes, probably <laughs> in this country it may be. Uh, they're also, uh, we're eliminating some of the confusing codes and this is, this is uh, um, uh, for example, AC, before meals, PRN, as needed, BID, twice a day, QD, every day, QID, four times a day, QOD, every other day, OD, every day, PC, after meals. I mean, who knows what those mean? And, and you get into a forest of things that uh, uh, cause, cause errors. Nobody knows what, what they mean anymore. Uh, it's very, and, and you shouldn't take a prescription that has those old Latin and Greek and some French terms on it. It's passe, um, and uh, 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 the Joint Commission even says they shouldn't be used. Uh, since we shouldn't use formulas in our prescriptions. Don't take a prescription with a formula in it because you might get MSO4, morphine sulfate, confused with, and that's a very serious uh, drug, MGSO4, magnesium sulfate. So don't prescribe 
with formulas. Uh, since uh, um, the FDA will no longer provide look-alike and sound-alike drugs, they're called LASAs, uh, Adderall, a stimulant for ADHD, Inderol, a beta blocker. You don't want to get, give somebody who needs a beta blocker for a heart condition Adderall. Okay. But it happens. It happens. Zyrtec, an antihistamine. Zyprexa, a powerful anti-schizophrenic, which can cause a brain and movement disorders. Um, most large hospitals today have or should have computer provider order entry, CPOE. You want to make sure that yours does. If you're going to a hospital or somebody you know is, it, it generally reduces medication errors by about 85%. Again, this is a system that screens drug interactions, overdoses, things, things of that nature. Um, this, is something that, this is something that is very, very important. And again, the money system of medicine seems to block it in most pl places. A great reform of early 20th century medicine was to allow nurses to make rounds with the doctors. Seems natural today. The nurses are actually taking care of the patients. They know the patients. Uh, they can describe their symptoms. A very, very important reform is something called clinical pharmacy. Your hospital should have it. Clinical pharmacy means that the pharmacist, pharmacist actually goes on rounds with the doctors. And the pharmacists really know about these drugs and know about drug interactions, not just between and among drugs, but with your body type, with your gender, with your weight, with your age. And when we have clinical pharmacy, we then get uh, a f over 40% reduction in overall medication errors and a, uh, 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 I think it's a 94% reduction in errors that cause uh, uh, fatal um, or very serious injuries. So 21st century medicine should include pharmacists rounding. A few hospitals have it, the minority. It stops a lot of errors, but most don't. Why money? OK. Infections. Infections are the soul-crushing injuries of medical care. You go into a hospital. You face a procedure courageously. You try to recover, and you're brutalized by an infection you get in the hospital. And it's, all, it's oh so common. When the, it kills over 100,000 people for, per year, hospital infections. You've heard of them, MRSA, C. diff, uh, VRE, vancomycin-resistant uh, enterococci, enterococcus. These are, these are brutal. These are brutal. And you don't want a bloodstream infection. So what, uh, what, what can you do? There are so many things that we know that we can do. You enforce hand hygiene. Every one of these bundles uh, for surgery, uh, uh, for central lines, for ventilators, for every procedure starts with hand hygiene. How hard can it be for providers to wash their hands? Apparently, it's pretty hard. And uh, what we do typically is we have um, nurses go around spying on people to make sure that they wash their hands. And if they don't, they get like, you know, traffic ticket or something. Um, yes? No, you don't wash for 15 minutes. You have to wash for 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Yeah. And there are some things that, that 
and I'm not going to go through them all today, but, but in a hospital they should know. There are some things that it's, it's more successful to wash with soap and water than it is to use the uh, uh, alcohol dispenser. Okay, but 15 seconds, that's key. And, and it just won't, most of the time, doctors and nurses are in a hurry. A lot of times they don't do it. A lot of times they'll come into your room, their gloves are already on. You have to say, did you just scrub? Are you coming from another room with those gloves on? Because it's, it's, it's fundamental. You don't want to get an infection, and uh, you stop them if you can. Now, the best way to, stop, to enforce hand hygiene is to uh, uh, have a camera by the alcohol dispenser or by the sink and make sure that the doctor does it. Uh, uh, doctors uh, 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 are afraid that somebody will review it, and that has a deterrent effect on their uh, behavior. Now, um, a lot of people talk about MRSA. We have methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus infection. We have an epidemic of that in this country. It's a brutal infection. You don't want to get it, okay? Well, how does MRSA get into a hospital? People bring it in, mostly patients. What they do in other countries, like the United Kingdom and Holland, but we don't do it here, and I cannot tell you why, is we swab people's noses in hospitals, we culture it, and if they have MRSA, either as an infection or the germs are colonizing, very specific protocols are implemented. And one is you isolate the patient. You don't move the patient around a lot. You put the patient, if necessary, with other MRSA patients. Um, you, you don't only you wash every time you go into a room. You take a new gown and new mask and they're disposable, and you get rid of it before you go into the next room. And when, when those MRSA protections are done, MRSA goes down. And it, in this country, it's the majority of, of staph infections. In other countries where there are uh, better MRSA controls, it's the minority. And the other staph infections are obviously uh, uh, more open to, uh, or more receptive to uh, uh, intervention with, with antibiotics. MRSA is more complicated. We have an epidemic of, in this country of still of bed sores and blood clots. Almost completely preventable. Everyone, particularly everyone elderly, but everyone having certain surgical procedures like a, a, a hip or a knee or gut surgery should have, or intracranial surgery, should, should be screened for blood clots. And if you're screened for blood clots, then you can have anticoagulation. You can have pressure devices, including some that like uh, automatic, they kind of squeeze you and things like that. You can bring down blood clots to almost nothing if you screen. Bad sores. Bad sores, a, a blood clot that starts in the hospital is an error. You shouldn't get a blood clot in the hospital. It is not a necessary frictional aspect of patient care should ask for screening so you can have an anti, so you can have an anti-clotting uh, 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 protocol. Bed sores shouldn't occur in a hospital. Should not occur. If a bed sore occurs in a hospital, and bed sores are very serious. I, 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 if you've known anyone who had one, um, <coughs> or you've had one yourself, 
They are killers. They'll kill you. 60,000 people in this country die from bad sores. And that complicates care tremendously even if, if you don't die. It lengthens care, gives you an infection. Uh, uh, it's really pretty nasty to get a bad sore. But people can be screened for bad sores. Is the person immobile ordinarily? In other words, not moving around. Is the person moist? probably due to incontinence. Uh, is the person well nourished? That leads to bed sores. Is the person well irrigated, getting enough water? Is the person elderly? Okay. There are tests. Uh, uh, two nurses in Nebraska uh, invented something called the Braden scale. I won't go over how you score it or anything like that. But people should be scored on the Braden scale to see if they need um, interventions. What are typical interventions? You got to be turned less than, every, less than every two hours. And you may need special bedding, uh, a, a special type of uh, uh, soft mattress, soft bedding. Uh, and you may need special wound care. You may need to, for example, if you start to develop one, well, first of all, people have to, have to inspect you if you're at risk, if, when you're screened for bed sores. You should be inspected. Okay, your whole body should be inspected because bed sores can develop anywhere where you have a thin level of skin over a bony protuberance such as in the sacral coccyx area, which is the, the main area. Nobody should get a bad sore. It shouldn't be expected. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be complacent about it. Okay, so bad sores. Another huge, huge complication, now considered an error in the field, is delirium. Delirium is a tremendous problem in hospitals. And with the elderly, we just think, oh yeah, grandpa's gonna, need, gonna start raving out of his mind and thinking that, that uh, uh, the nurse is <coughs> coming to rob him and he's gonna start flailing. And it's okay, give him restraints, that's fine, okay? No, it's not fine, it's not fine. Five to nine percent of people in hospitals who develop delirium then uh, uh, die. That's equal with sepsis. It's a tremendous problem in this country. And people should be screened for uh, 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 delirium controls. They're sometimes called hospital elder life programs. You want to be screened by that or if you have, particularly if you have an elderly person, you want him or her to be screened for it. Now, what does it mean? Studies have shown that if they apply these controls, delirium goes down 50%. What are they? Okay, typically there, uh, there are mental procedures like uh, uh, you score the person in terms of orientation, registration, things of that nature. The, the nurses and healthcare people around here will know what I'm talking about. There's something called the Fulstein mini mental status test that's very easy to give. You keep up the Fulstein. How do you do that? With people who screen for delirium, you play cards with them. You talk to them about their family backgrounds. You, uh, uh, you make sure that they have good sleep. You don't interrupt their sleep all the time with nurses and doctors and aides going in and out if you can avoid that, and usually, usually you can. You, you look into their drugs. Are they victims of something called polypharmacy, which is a whole 
cluster of drugs that interact. You look into their vision. If they're not seeing properly, you give them magnification or glasses. If they're not hearing properly, you give them uh, uh, amplification. And when that's done, and when they have a hospital elder life program, this problem of delirium goes down. So we have to screen people for risk factors. Similarly, falls. I'm not talking about like real sophisticated things here, but the doctors and nurses aren't doing a good job in terms of, of delirium or falls or blood clots. All of these are, are largely preventable errors. Uh, falls, your PCPs, most falls are in the community, by the way. And the best predictor of a fall is a history and physical where you see whether the person can get up without gripping the, the arms of the chair and or whether uh, uh, he or she uh, can do certain very simple tests. One is called tandem standing. Does anybody here know what tandem standing is? Tandem standing means you see if the person can stand with one foot, the, the toe of the foot touching the heel of the other foot for 10 seconds. Okay, then there's tandem walking. Tandem walking means that you can uh, uh, walk two meters heel to toe. Somebody can't do that, they're likely going to fall. And then you need a fall protection protocol, whether in the institution or in the community. Okay? There's a lot of things that you can do to build up people so that they don't fall, so that they don't have hip fractures. Vitamin D, some exercise, uh, vision is critical. Night lights are critical. People fall at night more often. They fall more often going downstairs than upstairs. No scatter rugs. Minor carpentry, because falls are devastating to the elderly. So uh, you're looking, you can train people to get some of their balance back. And of course, you want to prevent them from falling. Now, one of the things that is, I see I only have a couple minutes left, so I'm sorry. I know I, I didn't really get through my whole talk here. I'm going to talk about three critical reforms that are, are not implemented, and they must be. OK, infection control. We must get serious about infection control. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, over the past 75 years has developed evidence-based measures to deal with every form of infection in a hospital, in a lab, and a long-term care facility. For every forceps, for every uh, crutch, for every wheelchair, for everything that can infect them. MRSA, uh, C. diff, uh, uh, the fungal infections, Legionella, what have you. These are based on contact time with certain disinfectants disinf and, and sterilants. Sterilants are really total disinfection. Disinfectants don't and, and they're good enough for most things. They uh, um, uh, don't totally uh, kill infectious agents, including spores, which are the hardened defensive forms of microbes. Okay. Apply the CDC infection controls. Your hospital and nursing home should tell you that it will apply the CDC measures because they're not law. And the only time they are enforced is after an outbreak. 
So they are haphazardly applied. We need to make them either make them regulatory or when you go into a hospital, get the agreement that they'll do that. I can't think of anything that would uh, uh, depress infection more. Another thing that would infest, depress infection, don't, go, don't take a hospital room if you don't have to where the person before you has had C. diff or MRSA. Don't take it. That's the best indicator that you will become infected. Now, there's one exception to that, and that uh, you also have the right to see the room record of cleaning. When you see it, make sure that you're not getting a, uh, a room with somebody who had a terrible infection. You can also see if all high-touch surfaces like those around the bed, like the light switches, like the toilet handles, have properly been washed. You can also see if they've used an illuminometer for biofluorescence, which lights up the microbes. They're expensive, cost maybe $3,000 a piece. But you can't see a microbe otherwise. So try, you know, here's the thing about infection. Hospitals just won't spend on it, but we can disinfect. Okay, so that, that's very important. Now, I would take a room with somebody who had C. diff in it if we had a UV robot zapper, which some hospitals have, very expensive. Last I looked, cost $70,000 or an H2O2 hydrogen peroxide fogger. Both of them are very, will disinfect a room. So hospitals should buy them and use them, but they cost money. And hospitals should compete on the basis of their infection rates. When you see a US News and World Report study about who has the best orthopedic surgery and who has the best heart surgery, it doesn't matter if they have a high infection rate. You're going to get sick and die from that anyhow, or really sick. So it's very important that hospitals start to compete, that we, I'm just going to talk another three minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Sorry. Okay. So it's very important that we get infection down, and it's very doable. Apply CDC infection controls. You will never have Legionnaire's disease if you follow their controls about water systems. Keep the water either below 68 degrees or above 140 degrees. If in the, in the faucet traps you get Legionella, shock the system with chlorine. You won't have Legionella. It's, it, it's really wrong. We know how to do these things. Make hospitals and nursing homes follow CDC guidelines. There are comprehensive air and water uh, 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 systems for uh, hospitals. Now, I'm going to say one other thing, and this is one of the biggest debates in medicine today, and that's about error reporting. Error reporting. Uh, uh, has been critical to the safety of other hazardous ind industries like commercial aviation and uh, uh, nuclear. Okay, what do they do? They report everything of any seriousness and every near miss. And when you do that, what happens is you actually get more reports, but serious incidents go down. And that's what we find in medical care. Make them report everything, everything serious and every near miss. Actually do that in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, and serious incidents have gone down by about 12 or 15 percent in the surveyed period. It's over 2 million incidents, but they've got, they have started to go down. Overall, serious incidents are incidents that could cause death or serious bodily harm. They have gone down. Make them report everything. 
the, the best study was the New York cardiac study in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s. And the New York Department of Health found, and this is the best reporting study of the 20th century, they found that the hospitals that were doing coronary artery bypass surgery varied tremendously in terms of mortality rates. Some was, were 1%, some were 18%. So what did they do? They blew people's minds. They reported which hospitals had the high rates and which surgeons had the high rates. And you know what? It all went down across the system to, to below 1%. And other states, California, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the Veterans Health System have followed that, and they have the same results. Other states that don't have 50% higher rates of, uh, uh, of fatalities for this procedure. So you report. Now, in order to report, I think if people aren't doing horrible intentional things, if they're not trying to kill patients, or they're not operating drunk, or they're not raping patients, or you know, abusing patients, or something like that, if it's just an accident, and remember, I'm a lawyer, you immunize them. If they report, it's not part of a lawsuit. Get them to report everything. And if you do, I think you'll find that medical accidents go down, serious medical accidents go down the way air crashes and nuclear accidents have gone down. So those are my thoughts. Um, I, uh, we now have a Medicare do not pay list in this country. And unfortunately, it only includes 11 things that Medicare uh, won't pay for. Uh, the hospital has to eat it and get a fine. I think the list should be expanded. If I had more time, I'd tell you what, what uh, 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 should happen. But that's had a good effect. Um, and it's also raised about $300 million for Medicare. OK, here's the Medicare do not pay list. Object inadvertently left in after surgery, air embolism, that's a bubble, blood incompat incompatibility, that's a transfusion error, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, that's like a Foley catheter into the bladder, okay? Shouldn't be an infection. There are infection controls for that. A pressure ulcer, a bed sore, vascular catheter-associated infection, that's a, central, that's a central line. We know how to beat that. <clears throat> a surgical site infection should never be a surgical site infection. There are proper antibiotic, uh, antibiotics and draping controls and, and other controls that, that should prevent that. Uh, falls, certain types of falls and traumas in an institution, that's an error. If they cause harm, Medicare won't pay. Um, uh, complications following elective procedures, including orthopedic surgery, bariatric surgery for obesity. Shouldn't, there shouldn't be complications from that. Um, and uh, uh, poor control of blood sugar levels. Shouldn't happen in a hospital. That's an error. And uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism following a total knee replacement or a hip replacement procedure, shouldn't get a clot from that. And if you do, Medicare won't pay. I think it's really important. That list actually started under George W. Bush, uh, under something called the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005. It was only two items at that time. It's expanded to 11. In my view, and if I had more, I'd talk to you about more time, I'd talk to you about it should be expanded to 44 items. OK, I'm uh, uh, over time by four minutes. I apologize. There's a tremendous amount we can do to bring down this epidemic. Unfortunately, what we're doing 
is pretty much haphazard. It's not across the medical profession. It's not in every hospital. It's certainly not in every doctor's office. It should be. It should be. People don't have to die or be injured by this epidemic. Thank you very much.